Good morning, everyone. As some of you may have heard, one of our players was impacted by the recent bout of tornadoes and other inclement weather in the southern central United States, which has affected our ability to meet at our regular time to play the Quacko Paco campaign. Their home and belongings and family are fine, so there's no need to worry. It's just caused a disruption to our schedule. Until we can get back into the regular groove, please enjoy this previously Tier 2 patron-exclusive info dump and Q&A from February of this year from around the start of Season 4. Another source of content to hold you over is the TikTok channel being managed by Grace. Her shorts are so funny and are awesome highlights of the adventure so far that are so fun to listen to. They are also available on YouTube as shorts if TikTok is not your cup of tea, like for me. We are looking forward to returning back to the Quacko Paco's adventures as soon as we are able. Thank you for your patience. Hello everyone, it's me, Rich, the DM. And I thought I would take some time today to answer some of the questions that I've gotten on the Google form from you all. There's a couple different ways to access the form. Uh, if you're a Patreon listener, which you most likely are, if you're listening to this, uh, floating around one of the first posts ever posted, it's probably uh, organized by Q&A or something. If you search in the tags, there's a way to access that. But it's also in uh, one of the YouTube video descriptions that went live when we posted a Patreon, a formerly Patreon exclusive one onto YouTube. The link was included there. It's also on the Discord. There's a lot of ways to submit questions. So um, I like using the form, even though we get a ton of questions on the Discord. Keeping them in, in the form keeps them organized for me. Um, that being said, I think I'm going to review some older questions that I may have already answered just because they're good questions and I feel like I can provide different context now that I'm reviewing them in this in this sense. Also, the last time I answered questions, it was with the whole group. This time, it's just me. If there's any questions that are directed to a specific player, I'll do my best to answer it from my perspective, but of course, I'll bring it back up in a post-show or something. Before I get started, thank you for listening. Uh, if you're listening, you are either a patron or you've been listening to us for a while, and this has come up weeks after it's already gone live on Patreon. Either way, thank you so much. We literally couldn't be doing this without you. I don't mean we couldn't be playing the game. We would be playing this game by ourselves regardless which i mean is great and it's fun but it's a totally different experience getting to share with all these people and inspiring all these other groups and i wouldn't trade it for the world so the fact that you are supporting us and this means either by listening or by being a patron is indispensable to our ability to distribute um, our gameplay so i really really appreciate it that being said i'm going to answer some questions let's jump into it um, this one is almost certainly a review question, but I just feel like uh, running over it again. It says, hello, I'm trying to run a Pokemon style game for my playgroup sometime soon. I was curious how you came up with the passives for each character. Was it less from the background that I picked and instead more about how they described their characters to you? It's a really good question, and I think that's really where, as a dungeon master, your flavor can really, really come out, especially for a homebrew, right? Because if, if you're playing an official system like Pathfinder or D&D, your, your characters, your players are going to fall into set paths that are already predetermined. And when you're doing a homebrew like this, uh, you can really... you. I don't, it's probably just a mental thing, but I personally feel so much more liberated to just come up with stuff because the system we're playing isn't really D and D it's not D and D like if we're being technical about it, it's not, um, we're borrowing a lot of concepts. We use similar stat blocks, but the game is not the same. So I think, yeah, you, it's a combination of what you asked. Uh, I come up with the passives from their background, absolutely, especially from level one to three. Uh, I planned those passives more or less in session zero based on the information that the players gave me, what they were interested in, etc. And then from there, it just kind of expands and evolves. Uh, it's gotten to the point where right now at episode 50, uh, the players are at level 10, I believe. So we're starting to roll into some passives that are not homebrewed, not original. Uh, we just gave Cindy exploding dice because I couldn't think of anything else. Exploding dice is a real passive, I think, for wizards in D&D. Where when they're rolling damage, if they get a max roll on their dice, they get to re-roll it until it's not a max roll and keep adding that damage. It seemed appropriate for Cindy, and I was having a block. I didn't know what else to give her. Uh, that's probably the first passive that's come up that felt just like deliberately, truly stolen. Uh, it's Schmidt time, which was given at level 3 for Schmidt, which grants crits, uh, automatic crits on position bonuses and or, like having advantage. So like flanking and sneak attacks automatically crit. I, I'm not super familiar with rogues in D&D, &D, but that's definitely like a rogue archetype. It's no secret that I'm, uh, as the DM, I'm kind of ushering the party into a traditional tabletop RPG system as far as their character designs and really their combat and also their, role, their RP situations. That being said, they also kind of did it themselves. I'm not ushering them too hard. I would say the character I'm kind of ushering the most into it is Schmidt. That being said... 
Uh, Squids, our player Jacob, has the least experience with tabletop role playing games. Now that he's been playing with us for almost two years, he's 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 pretty established. He's only ever played Schmidt, but um, at the time at Session Zero, this was his first campaign, so he didn't have a whole lot of insight into like stat wise what kind of character he wanted to play. And so I definitely pushed him into a rogue archetype. Granted, it's like each character isn't strictly what they're based on. You know, I would say Schmidt is roguish. Elodie is bard ish. Um, Cindy. Cindy's kind of just a wizard or a sorcerer. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think that's she's a wizard. She's a wizard. I I don't think it's even ish. And then Gimli is just kind of a generic tank. He's kind of paladin, I suppose, uh, but also not really. He's got some weird like monk aspects, in my opinion, as well. Um, so again, they just kind of formed this themselves, which I'm super excited about because it's developed to a point where like we have a melee damage dealer and a melee tank. Right. So that's Schmidt and Gimli, respectively. And then we have a ranged damage dealer and like a ranged tank, a healer. Elodie has a lot of HP and her Pokemon are really buff, like as far as healthy. Um, But, you know, essentially a tank, a healer is basically a tank a lot of the time. Uh, And I'm just really pleased with how that turned out. It makes the combat like really strategic. And they're doing such a good job handling it. And again, they didn't have a ton of say in the situation because I'm giving them passives. That being said, and this will come up with answering other questions, is uh, because this is a homebrew and because this is my first time DMing and because none of us have a ton of experience with tabletop RPGs, I think uh, CJ Gimli probably has the most. Uh, There's a lot of stuff that doesn't make it into the recording that we're trying stuff out. There's some situations where we're like, this seems like a good way for this move or passive to work. Let's see if it feels balanced. And there's a lot of times where like we do something once and it's struck. We're like, nope, we're not doing that anymore. We can't do that. Or like we'll change how often something can be used, right? Um, it's like you can do this uh, once per combat and then it's like mm, once per long rest feels more appropriate. You know, there's stuff like that that comes up all the time. Changing things from, from free actions to bonus actions to regular actions um, because everything is so undeveloped like the team working on this homebrew is just the five of us that's really it um there's not any other sources going on there's a lot of trial and error that you just don't notice uh when you're listening normally which i think is a good thing because if we're releasing like a product of media i want it to feel somewhat polished even though it's very informal it's very casual we're not editing huge chunks of of outtakes like if you are a tier three patron and you hear the whole thing besides what we talk about like before we play and in the post show it's pretty much what you get in the edit right kira's doing a fantastic job but mostly what kira does is trim out silences and ums and ahs and just irrelevant things because maybe we get sidetracked it's like oh a cat jumped on my desk and like we put that in the bloopers or something like that's really what's going on at the end of the day what you're listening to is pretty genuine besides the little notes of like you know, there's even been times where we like rerun whole turns, right? Where we'll say uh, that mechanic didn't work the way I wanted it to. Let's start again from the top of initiative and <laughs> let's reroll it. If you're a Patreon uh, supporter, you'll also know that there's I was actually one whole session that we scrapped because it wasn't fun. Uh, I was trying a new mechanic, a new idea. You probably listened to it if you're listening to this, but if you haven't, it's interesting. Uh, we were doing I wanted to try PVP. And it wasn't the characters themselves, it was the Draconid Elders, and I positioned the Draconid Elders to be uh, related, well, one of them is familiarly related, but the rest of them, like, with their their class, somewhat related to the players. Um, And the PvP sucked. (laughs) It wasn't fun. So uh, we were going to release that, and then at the end of the session, we're like, well, let's redo that. And my players were all like, Rich, why don't you just make it a PvE thing, because you know how to do PvE, and I said, okay so that's when we introduced the mountain and like the nose pass and all those other things that you might remember from what episode 45 46 or something i think it was around there that was a really long-winded way to answer that question but long story short just make it up (laughs) i keep saying that in the discord uh people will ask oh like what do you think about this or like i'm in this situation what kind of thing do you recommend and i i can't understate like tabletop role playing in itself is normally very improv heavy. Like there's a lot of improvisation in general with your role playing with situations, right? Um, I think as a DM, that might be your most valuable skill. Just make it up. If you ever press for a situation, you don't want to go digging through rules again. That's where it feels like homebrews really liberate you. Um, there isn't a rule book. And in my opinion, at like my DM advice, a lot of you'll get different DM advice. And at the end of the day, the most important thing as a DM is to make sure your players are having fun. That's the number one rule. But if I were to make a suggestion based on the way that my DM style is, 
is I don't enjoy being a rules lawyer. I want to do things that are fun and I want to do things that like make sense and are fair. I think um, those are the, the the three tenets of my DM philosophy is fair, fun, and logical, right? Uh, if a player was like, I'm going to shoot laser beams out of my eyes, I would say, you can't do that. If a player was like, I'm going to do this sick trick where I jump off of Toidle and I handspring in the air and, and I do a, a, f- a flip kick into the team energy boss's face, I would say, maybe roll acrobatics and roll an additional strength check for the kick, right? So... Like, I, I think that's really important because that specific scenario, I just made that up. But if someone wanted to do a complicated specific scenario, it's going to be a huge pain to pull out from a rule book, right? If, if you're going off of D&D or something and you go into the 5 year rule book to get that specific of a thing, you're gonna, it's going to take like 30 minutes of research. So at, in, in the sense of just being efficient also for your table, just make it up. Just, <laughs> just, just make it up. That's, that's going to be coming up a lot in this chat, I think. For the next question, it was directed to me. Have you ever played this story before, or are you just making it up as it go? If not, how are you so creative to make this story? I play D&D, and I was wondering what to do to play a story like yours. Final question, what do you use for the Pokemon stat box? Do you copy real ones? Um, I'll just go one phrase at a time. Have you ever played this story before? Nope, absolutely not. I said this in the Discord, and I want to kind of say that uh, in a lot of ways, this campaign is very selfish to me. I don't think it's selfish in the way that I'm like putting my own NPCs in and I'm like playing as them. Uh, When I first introduced Symmetra, I didn't think that she would be such an integral part of the story, but the party just kept hanging out with her and they ended up getting good information and all of a sudden she's like really integral. So that's cool. That being said, I don't think I'm the kind of DM I can be corrected, of course, but I think that there's some tables where the DM just really wants to be a player. So they introduce an NPC and they kind of like do everything with the NPC. In my opinion, Based on my gameplay, like in the hideout, for example, sure, Sam got access to the computer to get the video logs and stuff. The party could have done that without her, but she was a good resource because she was familiar with the technology. But I think like in combat situations and stuff, I try and give her not being front and center, Uh, just like limited, more limited actions, not taking the the star of the show away from the players because that's that's why they're playing with me. That's why they're at my table is to play the game. And I feel like if I introduce all these NPCs that I'm controlling that are like the good guys, then it kind of takes away from the fun. In my opinion, that's more DM advice regarding the story. No, as I was saying, I mentioned this in the discord. This is self-fulfilling, not in the NPC sense, but in the sense when I was a kid, my most played game, probably still my most played game of all time was Pokemon Emerald. I also owned Ruby and I played that a lot. And at some point, my sister gave her her version of Sapphire when she was done with it. So I played a lot of third gen. I maxed out the clock on my Emerald version, and that was just on one save. I played multiple saves. So I as a kid being like, you know, it came out when I was probably six or seven years old and I played it until I was like 14 years old. Um, because I didn't have a DS. Uh, I didn't, I, the only generation I missed was the fourth gen. I went from Emerald and then I had a gap and then I picked it back up at Heart Gold, Soul Silver. So that's a pretty, it's a pretty big gap. I missed the whole generation. So I played a lot of Hoenn and I would replay it over and over and I would read the deck entries and I'd talk to all the NPCs and I ended up just having like a headcanon about the region. Um, it's easily my most familiar region just because I thought about it so much. So this campaign is kind of my self-fulfilling world that I dreamed up as a kid, as a, as a young preteen. I would just play this game and I had all these ideas about like, oh, like I feel like the win straights are like this. And like if they had more of a family member, like it'd be funny if they went like this direction with it. And a big one was like Meteor Falls. Like there's caves in this game, but Meteor Falls is like such a bright colored cave. Why is it white? Why is it so like different looking? That eventually led to me having my own headcanon about how the cave itself is a meteor. So it's it's rock isn't native to Hoenn. It's from space. And that's why it looks so weird. And then I got to thinking, oh, like what would happen if like Pokemon that are rock types that eat rocks for nourishment ate the rocks from Meteor Falls? How would that like influence their body? And that's how I came up with stuff like the giant Agron encounter. Um, it might not have been clear, but in my head, like uh, uh, space rocks probably have more dense minerals in them and Agron's a steel type and it's dex entry say that it eat rocks. It eats rocks. So in it just, I just made up that it would be super big because why not? Same with the mountain, right? In my head, the mountain is a Tyranitar. Larvitar's dex entry says that it eats a whole mountain. What if that mountain was made out of a meteor? It probably get really big. So this, you know, I, there's a lot of moments in this story that that is being made that yes, a lot of it's improvised, but I'm improvising from a bank of all these like made up fantasies about the Hoenn region in my head. And that is the reason I picked Hoenn. 
I think I could DM for any region pretty okay. Uh, but I just know Hoenn the best, and I feel like it makes the most rewarding experience. So to any Hoenn fans out there, I'm I, I'm I'm with you. I get it. If Hoenn's not your favorite region, I hope I can breed some creativity and some life into it. I feel like I've included a lot of little Easter eggs um, to things that are actually in the region. Um, there are some NPC trainers that I've plugged that are like real trainers. Um, the house with all the wingles in it always stood out to me as a kid on the route that is south of Fortree. Like, why is there a house that's full of wingles? And then I had the party stay there. Uh, there, there's a lot of little things that I'm finally getting to experience, and there's a lot of things that I can't wait for the party to get to so I can fulfill it for myself. It's selfish, but I think you have to be a little selfish as a DM. There's certain things that if you are passionate about, you will make your players feel passionate about it. As long as you don't go overboard and like force it down their throats, I think if they notice your passion, they will play into it. So I would recommend that as a DM. Next part of this question. Um, how are you so creative to make this story? I think I just answered that. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, I played in D. I was wondering what to do to play a story like yours. Get get involved. Get interested. If whether or not you're using a homebrew or pre-existing material, um, if there's something that's playing out in a way that you don't care about, that you don't feel passionate about, just change it. We're just playing make believe. Make it cooler, at least for you. And again, I think the same logic holds true. If you are passionate about your game, your players will feel that passion and they'll reciprocate, and it'll be more fun for everyone. I think. Um, final question, what do you use for Pokemon stat blocks? So I am more or less lifting from D and D five E, uh, just for the core stats, right? For strength, con defense or defense, strength, con dexterity, HP, etc. Um, and I am translating those via the Pokemon stat blocks specifically on Bulbapedia. I go to Bulbapedia and HP is kind of a one-to-one. -one. Of course, well, not one-to-one -one because in game stats at like level 50, for example, are way higher than something you would have in a role-playing game but i scale them relatively uh hp in the games correlates to con and their actual hp stat uh attack in the games almost always correlates to strength maybe dexterity in some situations like absol in my opinion um i consider absol like a roguish kind of character like it, so i want to give it more dex because it seems nimble its speed stat is low but my head canon is that it's like nimble so uh, I would give its attack stat more of a direct translation to its deck stat. Uh, for intelligence, because Pokemon are pseudo animals, it's really rare for them to be particularly intelligent unless they're psychic types. Psychic types use intelligence as their primary stat for, for dealing damage. So psychic kind of, I feel like it gets a weird little buff here in this game because so many Pokemon have low intelligence. If you have a psychic type that's forcing intelligence saves for their attacks, most Pokemon are going to do pretty poorly into it. So this is might be like a little Gen 1 pandering because of how strong uh, psychic types are. Something to consider um, when if you're making a Pokemon homebrew. If you want to use intelligence as a stat based off of D&D &D 5e, consider using your psychic types a certain way, I guess. Uh, don't make them too strong. I feel like I'm slipping into that slope. But that being said, in my head canon, in a real Pokemon world, psychic types would be crazy. They would be super powerful because they would be able to influence humans the most, in my opinion. That's what I think uh stat blocks um sometimes i reference the now defunct pokemon 5e uh i'll just like take a look and see what they did i usually make changes uh, there's, there's some moves i've taken one for one uh, i only have their handbook that goes up to gen 4 and i'm not interested in like seeking or distributing their materials because their dm who i was in touch with on twitter asked everyone to please not so i try to respect that but i already have the handbook for fourth gen on my computer so i look at it um and so I do get some inspiration from P5E, but most things end up changed by the time that I get to them. So P5E also uses like a complicated like loyalty system and like you can't catch Pokemon that are of a certain challenge rating and stuff. And I just kind of scrapped uh, a whole bunch of that. So, yeah, that's my thought on that. We'll move on to the next question. Is this your first time playing D&D &D all? If not, how much experience do you have? So this is my first time DMing. Um, I've been in three other campaigns that um, were never finished. Uh, I did, I, I I did a three point five D and D campaign. That was my first one. I fell into the classic beginner trap of being like, "Wow, a druid sounds so fun and cool," and then it's your first time playing, you just get overwhelmed with druid stuff. Like it's just so much to take in. I wish someone talked me out of it, but it was still fun. I enjoyed role playing that. Uh, my second campaign, probably my favorite. Um, we didn't quite finish, but it was it was in Feyrun in D&D &D 5e, but it was like a homebrewed 
plot and lore and stuff it was just like the there was no module our dm was making it up he did a great job i was playing a paladin uh, that was a lot more fun i wish that felt like my real first character because paladins are a lot easy to to interpret to take hold of um he was really fun he was he was kind of a classic paladin very fair and just but i made his little t- tweak is that he was raised in a house of like artistic scholars and artisans and he loved sculpture and he hated seeing like art be vandalized or destroyed uh and that was like instead of him just caring about justice he also cared about like aesthetic and i thought that was a really cool motivation for a paladin and i want to bring him back because that was really neat that was a really fun group that was probably my favorite group i played in uh we did a lost minds of fandelver for a bit we didn't finish it that was fine i was playing a barbarian that was all right Uh, I didn't like him as much as the Paladin, but he was still cool. It was fun to just run at things. You know, it's like I pop my rage and I run into the fight like that never gets old, but it it is a little simple. Um, So and then I started a what's the campaign called? Um, The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, like the Feywild 5e campaign. And I was playing a warlock. That was delightful. We were about four sessions in um and that was super cool we were playing a module but our dm was very respectful about like yeah you can make stuff up and we as a group kind of decided we all wanted to do like pseudo animal characters so i pu- i pulled like um it's not a homebrew i think it's third party dnd like they became official when wizards of the coast adopted it but you want tea race it's they're like snake people um we had like a monkey person we had a bugbear <laughs> on the team actually uh it was it was a really fun group and it was cut short unfortunately but uh maybe we get back into it i don't know the the a lot of the people involved like really picked up their careers when we were playing so that's just me um i'll bring this up in the next post show discussion if possible probably episode 52 but uh grace elodie has a good amount of experience um she's dm'd a little bit she started to dm her own pokemon campaign which sounded really really cool um i would pull her after our sessions and be like, tell me what's, what's been happening. But I think, uh, she finished her degree and now she's not doing that anymore, but she's, she's pretty experienced. She's, she knows what she's doing. Um, yeah. Melissa and CJ, Cindy and Gimli, they play a lot together. Um, so I'm pretty sure they have quite a bit of experience. They use D and D beyond a lot. I think they're the most experienced in the group. And then going into this, um, Jacob slash Schmidt has no experience. I invited him. This was his first time doing anything like this. And I think, He's doing a great job. If you're in the Discord, uh, you should let him know. You should send him a message or ping him or something. Be like, hey, I found out that this was your first time playing and you're doing great. So that is that for that question. Let's move on. Next question directed to me. Um, I'm a DM in a D&D campaign and I'm not really sure what to do. I just want to know how to be a good dungeon master. Again, I think I just made it up. I, that's that's applicable in multiple senses i just made it up just now saying the three tenets of dming is um having fun being logical and being fair if you stick to those three rules i don't think it matters at all what you do um if it's fun it's logical and it's fair your players are gonna have a good time and also getting yourself personally invested into it you don't want to run a module that isn't yours that you don't care about you don't want to run a module that is yours that you homebrewed that you don't care about you need to Find a way to be invested without overshadowing the players and source your enjoyment off of their enjoyment is something I recommend. If you're not capable of doing that, if you're DMing and it's just not fun, no matter what you do, honestly, stop DMing. I don't mean that in the sense like you're a bad DM. I mean that in the sense that the whole point of playing these games, these silly make-believe games where we roll dice all the time, is to have fun. If there's any other motive behind it or you're not having fun, stop. Don't do it. If you're still interested in playing and like you want to have fun, but your current table isn't making it work for you, whether you're the DM or the player, find a new table. Um, It's not worth playing and investing all these hours into this game if you or someone is not having fun. Uh, I can't drill that in enough. If you are having fun and your players are having fun, you're a great DM. That's the only thing that matters, in my opinion. Um, even if you just forego all the rules or maybe your rules are a little strict and your players like that it's it's really every table has its own dynamic and that being said i feel so blessed to have the players that i have kind of just invited them out of nowhere if you're a member of the discord and you're familiar with me always talking about the calyrex game corner it's this little community of friends that developed over the 2020 pandemic where we all met um on official vgc commentator gabby snyder's twitch stream We kind of all got into like making our own content and stuff. The content creation has granted slowed down a little bit, but we still stream on Twitch and stuff every now and then. But um, among that friend group are these four players that we all met on Twitch during the pandemic. And um, granted, we would have like text chats and we'd hang out on voice calls and stuff and we'd like watch each other's streams. We've all streamed at some point. 
Uh, but I kind of just invited them on a whim. I was like, these people seem like they'd want to play a Pokemon D and D game, and it's been great. It's like I can't imagine having a better party. So that's really, really awesome. Um, I want to know how to be a good dungeon master. What I was saying, just make it fun. And I do want to say, if it's not fun, give up. And I'm not saying give up like you're bad. I'm saying well, it's not worth the energy to force it, is what I'm saying. So don't be afraid to pull the plug if it's not succeeding, because uh, I, I'm, I wanted to say we're all adults. I don't know if we're all adults. I don't know if you're listening to this if you're an adult. But even if you're not an adult, even if you're a teen, time is valuable, and you don't want to waste your time not having fun playing a game. That's really what it comes down to. Next question. How do you treat player level ups? I, I feel like I keep it pretty similar to D&D. Um, the really, the straightforward, most straightforward thing that's exactly like D&D is HP. Uh, I let the players roll um, a D8 plus their con mod for a new HP total, or I just let them take five. I think that's straight out of D&D 5e, no question. Besides that, um, I kind of copy a level up chart from 5e. Not exactly, but... Every level, I let them get at least one new move. Well, sorry, they can only pick one new move, but they have access to a whole bunch of options, and I increase the pool as they level up. I guess that's Pokemon, not trainers. Yeah, I guess the question is player level ups. So they don't learn new moves, but every three or so... So, like, there's different... How do I explain this? Every upgrade is cyclical. So we'll say, like, at level two... I don't know if this is accurate or not. I don't have my notes open, but at level two, we'll say they get an ability score increase at level three. They get a new passive at level four. They get nothing at level five. They get an ability score increase at level six. Like it just repeats. I have a, I have have like a series of three things that happen at their levels and they just repeat. They get HP every time, whether or not they get a new passive or something depends. Sometimes I grant passives based on their gameplay regardless of level up. Sometimes they get a passive because they've been doing a thing for a while, right? Or sometimes I give them mastery over an over a proficiency rather than just or maybe I grant a new proficiency, right? Um I feel like it's good to be in tune with how your players are handling their characters and if they're doing something consistently, just logically, it means two things. One, the player enjoys doing it. Two, the character is probably getting skilled at it. So I would keep that in mind. Um, I think there's also something to consider that I haven't done for my party very much, but something interesting is items or situations that permanently alter stats, either raising them or lowering them, like getting a magical item that raises a stat or becoming cursed and like losing stats. I think that's really interesting. I haven't played with that much, so maybe I'll get into that in the gameplay in a bit. And if you notice it, you'll be like, I remember when Rich talked about that in the behind the screen. Uh, that's something really interesting and fascinating that I want to want to think about a little bit i think that's pretty neat Um, i think that answers that question next one directed to me mechanically how do you handle different battle scenarios gym challenges versus boss fights versus trainer battles with four players each with multiple pokemon this has been a work in progress but i think it's finally at a point that like i we all agree on every combat we've been adjusting this but in my head um we so there's you've described two different capacities. There's official battles like versus trainers and gyms. And then there's battles against wild Pokemon and criminals and like bosses. Uh, They have very different rules. Trainer battles, gym challenges, Pokemon are never in danger of dying is the way that I see it. It's an official capacity. I imagine there's judges. I imagine there's like medics, you know, there's like nurse joy and stuff around. So those are always just kind of puzzles to be solved and there's no existential threat. Uh, wild Pokemon don't care about the rules. Um, boss Pokemon and like Team NRG or other criminals, villains, <clears throat> they don't care about the rules. So that is when it enters kind of more into like there's real stakes. I think it's good to have a balance because winning gyms is important for this party and like it's satisfying for them. And the stakes are that they lose and they waste their time potentially, right? So I think that's an interesting uh, thing that you don't have a whole lot in D&D in like regular D&D, but Pokemon battles are regulated is the way that I see it generally. But as far as using multiple Pokemon, what I sourced was honestly, we all play VGC. If you don't know what VGC is, it's the official Pokemon format. Um, it is not singles, it's actually doubles. It's double battles where you have a team of six and you have a best of three and you bring four Pokemon. It sounds complicated and convoluted, but it's not. Instead of doing best of threes, I'm kind of thinking double battles in my head like they're managed in a way that like if you how do i describe this i don't know i'm going to stop trying to compare it to the game and talk about what i do because double battles are official to me 
I do not penalize the players for using two Pokemon at once. If we are considering the lore of like certain tables, certain um, tabletop RPG methods that a turn for each individual person is six seconds, or maybe that's a round. I don't even know. Um, either way, I feel like you can give a command to two Pokemon in a turn. That sounds right to me. Um, and those Pokemon would be able to do one main thing and maybe one bonus action. And the trainer probably wouldn't be able to do anything. So that's where I have it balanced now. Let me actually pull up exactly what we are currently using. Uh, so right now how we have it is that if a trainer sends out one Pokemon, that Pokemon and the player character gets full use of their actions. There's no restrictions at all. If they have two Pokemon out, both of the Pokemon get full use of their actions and the trainer must e either sacrifice their own action or their movement which I think is pretty realistic for a turn, right? The trainer's giving commands, and if they're speaking, they might not be able to do other things that they want, or maybe they don't move around. I think that's fair. With three Pokemon, the trainer is completely restricted because all they have time for is giving commands. So there's no action or movement from the trainer if they're using three Pokemon. And um, the trainer also makes saves at disadvantage slash is easier to target by their enemies. So if you're using three Pokemon, it's effective, but your trainer can't do anything else, which I think is a really good way to balance it. If especially like you're not going to have three Pokemon out in, a, in an official battle capacity, it's always going to be against villains or wild Pokemon or something. So in my opinion, that's pretty fair. Any more mods than that and the penalties to the trainer and the Pokemon get more and more strict. That's how I currently have it balanced. I think it works well. I have no idea what other Pokemon tabletop RPGs do. That's just kind of what I have, and I like it, and I recommend it. I think it's pretty fair. I think if a table wanted to just say, no, just do one at a time, that's also realistic, too, because honestly, as a DM, it gets a, it, there's a lot to track, <laughs> for sure. So, next question. If you could add any legendary beyond team typing to your team, which would you want? This is, um, this is to the players. I don't think I really have an answer to this. Um, I don't know. They'd have to they have to go. Uh, I'll have to bring this up to them when we have a, the next post show discussion. So I can't speak for them. I really don't know. I'm thinking about who their favorites might be. And like, obviously, like Schmidt would probably want like a flying type. Right. But yeah, who knows? Can't answer that. Up next. Do you play other video games? If so, what ones? Are there any not out yet that you're excited for? This is directed to everyone. Again, I'll bring this up to everyone when the time comes. Uh, yes. Pokemon is definitely my favorite franchise, but there's a lot of other games I like as well. Another Nintendo franchise I'm a big fan of is Fire Emblem, and I say that and I've only played three houses in this new one, but it's just the gameplay is really satisfying and I look forward to exploring other games in the series. Other Nintendo series I like, I'm a pretty moderate fan of Zelda. I'm not like the biggest fan. I didn't really grow up with it, but I like the games. They're fun. Uh, I love Pikmin. Pikmin is a ton of fun. Uh, I had a big League of Legends phase when I was younger, probably like in college. I played like a lot of League of Legends. Uh, MOBAs are really addicting and hard to keep up with. I, I put 9,000 hours into League and I put $1,000 into League and it didn't really do much for me. So I'm, I'm kind of good on it. I play Pokemon Unite now with CJ and some other people from the Discord, which is fun. It's fun in its own right. It's it's easier to not feel like your life is getting sucked away because the games are limited to 10 minutes, which I think is probably a good thing overall. But MOBAs are, they're so fun, but they're so bad, but they're so good. It's If you play MOBAs, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I really like Metroidvanias. That being said, that includes Metroid, that includes Castlevania, that includes Hollow Knight. Um, I'm really into that kind of thing. I used to be really big into RPGs. Uh, Earthbound is probably my favorite game ever. I love that game. Uh, I haven't played as many RPGs lately, like turn-based ones, um, but I'm curious about them, and I feel like I want to get into more of them, like Final Fantasy, uh, stuff like that. So maybe someday I'll get back into that. Uh, everyone, uh, everyone likes Pokemon, obviously. That's how we all met, but I will let them speak to their own uh, subjective opinions when I ask them that question. Next question directed to Gimli, so I'll see if I can answer it. What was your reaction to hearing that Gimli's son was hanging out with Champion Red? I think he's spoken to this a little bit, and it's in the post-show discussion. So, um, yeah, that's a plot point I will not speak to. So I, I will move on, but uh, we will see if, uh, if, if CJ has anything to say about it. This one's directed to Schmidt. If Team Energy hadn't attacked Mauville, would you have continued solo? Um, that's kind of interesting. Um, that is a thought. Uh, I don't want to speak to this too much, but um, 
yeah, that was a decision that I fully supported for Schmidt to make. I felt like it made sense in character. Um, the player and the character were just ha- not having a good time. Part of that was circumstances outside of the game. I'm aware, but I don't want to go too much into detail into that. But I th- just I felt like it just made sense. It made sense for Jacob as a player. It made sense for Schmidt as a character. Uh, at that time, there was no real strong bond form with the party yet. Like the, the he basically Schmidt as kind of like again this <laughs> this ties into the rogue archetype that I forced him into, so it kind of works. Uh, he didn't really. I don't want to say he didn't care about the party at that point in the campaign, but Schmidt was still, he wanted to get home. He had no real ties to these guys at all. He just happened to be traveling with them. If anything, they put him in danger that he didn't really need to be in. He just wanted to go to the gyms and go home. And that was his primary motivation. He wasn't missing a family member. Uh, He just wanted to leave home. And the best thing for him to do was just to ignore the funny business that was happening. He just went through an awful evil trick house where he died and had to fight Hoopa. And then he goes back up north and there's these villains that are like trying to, you know, take over a city. And he's and like, no, he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't want to be part of that. I don't blame him. I think I think that situation rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, but I think it was perfectly executed. Uh, It was a lot of bullshit. And I think Schmidt and Jacob were kind of like, yeah, this sucks. But that being said, uh, you know, a year later after that happened in real time, I think Schmidt has legitimate reasons to be with the party at this point. And oddly, I think that's a really common thing with rogues and people that play rogues, right? Uh, They're generally rogues aren't really team players, which is what makes them strong in fights, right? They're really good at sneaking around and doing their own thing. Um, but yeah, I didn't expect the rogue archetype that I kind of was pressing, not railroading, but encouraging Schmidt to take to really uh, form itself in that way. And again, part of that was for circumstances beyond the table that were, were stressful for Jacob. But I think that it worked in a narrative way that was honestly really successful, despite how many people took it negatively. And in my opinion, um, maybe Jacob will speak to this, but maybe not. Next question for me. Hi, Rich. I've been watching your show for a while and it inspired me to try my own Pokemon tabletop game with some friends. My question was, how do you go about, as the DM, planning what Pokemon you'd have your players fight, catch, or interact with, given that there are over 900 Pokemon now? Yeah, now there's over 1,000. If this was asked previously, I apologize. I only got access to Patreon content today and haven't seen all of it yet. Hope you and the rest of the group have a great day slash week slash month. Thank you for asking. Great question. Um, This ties in again to in the past when I was a kid and I was playing the game and I was just like, this Pokemon should be on this route. Why is this Pokemon not on this route? I think this makes sense. So that's part of it. Um, There's been situations where I'm coming up with encounter tables. The one that comes to mind immediately is the fishing table outside of Meteor Falls. Um, I didn't know if for sure if the players would fish there, but I just, they hadn't fished yet. I just felt like I wanted them to fish. So I would propose it. If they took the bait, (laughs) pun intended, then it would work. And they did, they did take the bait. Um, that table, I went to a separate discord server with some friends that I have that are Pokemon fans. And I was like, Hey, I'm making an encounter table. You want to give some suggestions? And they all did. And it was great. And it's the Pokemon that were caught were all Pokemon that were suggested. So like sometimes I outsource it, right? There's also a tool online for a random Pokemon generator. I forget exactly what website it is, but it, you just click a button and it shows you one to 10 random Pokemon. And sometimes I would click on that until I was inspired. I would see something like, um, like Gumi, actually, the very first encounter of the campaign, I was trying to come up with like a rare encounter on a 20, which Cindy happened to roll, which was awesome. And to think how integral Cookie is in this campaign now, too, which is so cool that it was the first encounter and it was a crit. I just I love Cookie. Cookie's a really awesome Pokemon character. That aside, uh, yeah, I was trying to come up with something that would be like a really cool encounter for the party and didn't feel too strongly aligned with any of their type specialties. At that point, Schmidt was still a normal type trainer or like thinking that he would be, but he's definitely evolved into flying. Although normal is really closely related to flying. Anyways, yeah, I used the random generator until I saw something and I was like, Gumi, Gumi seems like a treat. Like it takes some investment to evolve, but it's a pretty powerful dragon and it's cool. So, um, and then that evolved into getting a uh, regional form, which was just also extra cool. And just, yeah, there's so much cool stuff that happened with cookie. I'm really pleased with that Pokemon. Final question. Um, this series has inspired me to make my own Pokemon tabletop role-playing game called balls and besties. Great name. Fantastic name. I was wondering how you created it. How do you create the health pools for each Pokemon, etc.? Yeah. Again, I kind of referenced the stats, um, 
I've actually both on the Patreon, which I'm assuming you've been on if you were asking this question and pinned in the discord. I gave an example creation of Absol. I think that's why I brought it up earlier is because it's just what came to mind. I thought it was a good example because uh, the stats, you can clearly see how they translate from the in game, like the video game from the tabletop RPG that I'm doing, but they're also modified. Like Absol is a high attack stat in the video games and it's slow. And it's like to me and based on the lore and me, I haven't seen the anime in a long time, but how I imagine it would look in the anime. I don't think Absol would be slow. I think it would be like a fast assassin. So that's why I gave it dexterity because in the system that we're using, that's based off of D and D five E that's what makes the most sense. So I think, again, based on this topic, if I have any advice, it's like use all the source material that you have. Um, Use your head to be creative a little bit. Like if you see Absol, like I don't think it's attack stats very high. I think it's dex dex stat is its main stat. Stuff like that. Just like make conclusions on your own that you think are interesting and that might be interesting to the players and just wing it. Uh, This is the last question, so I'll reiterate this. If you've been in the Discord at all and you see any questions get asked to me directly, it's always, always make it up. Just make it up. Make up something that's cool. That's the spirit of D&D, is my opinion. It's not all about the books. It's not all about doing everything the right way. It's about doing it the fun way. And sometimes you don't have time to reference the books, or sometimes it's a homebrew that has no actual information, like the one that we have. So sometimes you just you just got to make it up. Uh, I hope that helps. I hope that answers your question. Please ask me more questions. Uh, this form is going to stay open. Uh, if you are a repeat question asker, that's f- totally fine. Um, you can also ask me questions directly in the discord and if they're good ones i'll try and include them here the next time that we do it once again thank you for supporting could not be doing this sort of thing without you very we all very much appreciate it and war i can't wait for the next one thank you so much for listening and i'll catch you later